All right, let's take a poll. <laughs> iPhones, right? Which one? iPhone, Android. iPhone first. That <laughs> looks like that is a winner. Android. <laughs> okay, looks like 75, 25. It's nice to see you guys. <laughs> the iPhone is 10. Uh, and I think all of us can agree that it's probably changed the way we do things more than anything in the past hundred years. We're never bored. We're never lost. We're always in touch. We call it a phone, but it's really nothing like a phone. It's actually a supercomputer that fits in our pocket. As if somebody came up with took all the electronics that had been invented in the past hundred years and squished them and put them in one little device. I'd argue, actually, that it's changed what it means to be human. We argue differently than we used to because we can fact check inst instantaneously. There's less need to memorize because we have everything right here. Medical schools are actually changing their curriculums because they used to be incredibly heavy on memorization. Now they know that doctors are gonna have one of these. And so they're changing how they teach new doctors. So I wanna share a little bit of the secret history of the iPhone with you. I learned about all this because four years ago, I wrote a book called Dogfight about how Apple and Google went to war and started a revolution. It was a hard book to do. The companies didn't give me a whole lot of cooperation. And so I talked to about 100 people over two years at both of the companies and came away with a tale of Two companies really going at it full bore over their vision for the future. But I also learned something else. I learned how Silicon Valley really works. How ideas that most people think are absolutely crazy go from that to this, to completely changing the world. One of the people who helped me understand that is this guy. Andy was one of the first engineers on the iPhone starting in 2005. But two years later, in 2007, when Steve Jobs was showing the iPhone to the entire world, Andy and his colleagues were so filled with dread that they were drinking scotch in the audience, just a few feet away. <laughs> this wasn't a party, or even your case of pre-performance jitters. Andy actually thought the whole thing was gonna crater. And he had every reason to actually think this. He'd been with Steve Jobs most of the week during rehearsals, and he hadn't actually seen Jobs make it once through the performance without the iPhone glitching, or shutting down, or doing something unpredictable. He'd been at Apple for 15 years, and he'd never actually seen anything like this before. Andy was in the middle of all this because his job was to be in charge of how all the radios worked in the iPhone, and really, a cell phone is nothing more than a fancy two-way radio which meant that Andy had a particularly big job. The reason for all this angst, though, was that Jobs wasn't using production quality phones to show off. He was using prototypes, actually bad, ugly, not very well designed, not very well working prototypes. Some of them had gaps between the screen and the 
uh, plastic edge. Some of them had plastic instead of glass screens. There's a reason why at the unveiling, Apple put all the iPhones in these circular spinning cases. They actually didn't want people to get too close or to touch any of them. Andy had done what he could do to prepare for the worst. It was actually kind of magnificent when you think about it. He'd ordered, he'd soldered with Jobs' permission 20-foot wires to the iPhone's Wi-Fi antenna, had them go off stage to make sure the Wi-Fi reception worked fine. He pre-programmed the iPhone's display to always show five bars of cell reception <laughs> in case it disconnected from the cell network. And he made the iPhone think that it was operating in Japan to thwart hackers in the audience. Well, we all know what happened. We all know how the story ended. Jobs' performance went flawlessly. And now almost all of us have an iPhone or an Android phone in our pocket. But here's the thing. While Andy and all the engineers at Apple and at Google expected their products to be enormous hits, none of them expected what's happened today. None of them expected these devices to become as ubiquitous and as life-changing as they've become. Yes, it's invented the selfie, but I've also seen these things used as insulin pumps. To give you some perspective on this, when Jobs unveiled the iPhone, he said he was expecting to get 1% of the cell phone market in the initial years. 1%. I think half the world, half the world, at least in the United States, owns an iPhone now. Um, also, most of the things that we think of as being part of having a smartphone, like the App Store, didn't exist. Why am I telling you all this? Because what Andy went through tells us a lot about how Silicon Valley worked then and works today. And we're spending a lot of time thinking about Silicon Valley and how it works today. In fact, Silicon Valley has become the boogeyman. We used to be completely enraptured by these devices, but in the past few years, we're now starting to ask correctly questions like, what are they doing to our kids? What are they doing to us, our lives, our families, the way we converse, the way we are as people? We're asking questions like, who's in charge of our lives? This or us? And more importantly, who are these companies that are on the other end of these devices? How did they get so big? What Andy's story tells us, oddly, is that what happens in Silicon Valley actually isn't as calculated as we want to think it is. That doesn't excuse the kind of things that Facebook and Twitter and Google were getting hammered for in Congress a couple of weeks ago. But it does make me, at least, feel like our problems are a little bit more fixable than we might think. That Maybe these companies are evil, but it's also true that maybe they're just clueless. And that maybe we can educate them. And so as we think about solutions, I want to talk through three things with you. First, 
Most of the work that gets done in Silicon Valley, it's important to remember this, most of the work that gets done in Silicon Valley is impossibly hard. That isn't an excuse, it's just a fact. And it's worth keeping in mind, yes, there's been some bad behavior and there's no excuse for what's going on there. But it's also worth keeping in mind when we want to play the blame game. Creating the iPhone, as I'll show you momentarily, creating Tesla, a self-driving car, or even Facebook, is like climbing Mount Everest. The number of people who actually successfully do it, minuscule. To build the iPhone, for example, Apple built dozens of prototypes, starting with this. Isn't that the ugliest thing you've ever seen? Yeah, the iPhone actually started out as a tablet, a big, ugly tablet, before Steve Jobs decided to shrink it to make the iPhone first. Another prototype just turned the iPod into a phone. It stuck a cell phone chip in an existing iPod and used the click wheel as a phone dialer, kind of like some sort of modern rotary phone. <laughs> then there were examples like this. At one point, the design guys at Apple thought it would be awesome to make the phone entirely out of aluminum, which looked beautiful, except when the engineers told them that radio waves don't really travel through aluminum. Tony Fidel, who's well known as the guy who not only was an important player on the iPod and the iPhone, but also then left Apple to start Nest and sold that to Google, um, said, it was like working on the moon mission. Back then, our phones looked like this. Smartphones had styluses and navigation buttons and keyboards. And Jobs said what we really wanted was a phone that looked like this, all screen and one button. You know, we're pretty used to typing on our virtual keyboard now, but in 2007, that seemed preposterous. Steve Ballmer, the CEO of Microsoft, famously got on CNBC and talked about how preposterous it was. Um, Back then, people had Blackberries precisely because of their keyboard. The second thing I want to talk to you about and hope you guys will remember is that happy accidents play a much bigger role in how things happen in Silicon Valley than any of us want to believe. And that certainly anybody in Silicon Valley wants to tell you. The Valley is awesome at creation myths, but it's important to remember that most of these are just myths. Most people, for example, think that the iPhone was a huge success right out of the gates, and the answer was it was not. It was three times more expensive than any of the phones on the market. It ran on a cell connection that was slower than anything else that was out there. Its camera was mediocre. It didn't shoot video. And you couldn't add software to it. That's right, the App Store. The thing that we associate as being central to all these things, all these smartphones, this App Store didn't exist. And in fact, Jobs 
was asked about the App Store when he unveiled the iPhone and he said, that's a crazy idea. Why would I want programs on my phone from other people that could inject viruses and other kinds of problems on the way the phone operated? It actually took his engineers a year and a half to convince him to change his mind. The last thing I want to talk to you about is this. It's human nature to think that all revolutionary technology is all good and zero bad. The reality is, is that's rarely true. Miracle drugs sometimes kill people. Electricity still starts fires. In California, they're talking about how maybe downed power lines were the result of the massive fires in Sonoma and Napa that burned half of Santa Rosa. Automobiles still kill 40,000 Americans a year. So while we spend a lot of time thinking about what the iPhone is doing to our lives and what our screen-obsessed world is affecting us, we should remember that we've actually, as a society, been here before, often. That doesn't make, let me be clear, that doesn't make some of the stuff that the social networks have been accused of during the election remotely okay if they're actually guilty of that. But historically speaking, it's also part of the normal cycle of how technologies get assimilated into society. So the point I'm getting at is the past 10 years has been about everyone getting an iPhone or an Android phone or some kind of smartphone. The next 10 is going to be about coming up with rules and norms and laws to help us have these things in our lives more effectively and more um, happily. We've already started doing this, right? You know, we talk to our kids about online behavior. Schools now take phones away and keep kids from using them during, on, while they're on campus. Um, restaurants and theaters have become very, very, very strict about who and what can use iPhones during performances. Uh, we've made texting and driving illegal. Sexting is a crime. But it's clear to me that the next set of changes, that the next set of moves actually has to come from the companies themselves. In pursuit of growing their businesses, these companies might not have realized the impact that they're having on society, but they are having an enormous impact and they actually now need to step up and do something about it. Tristan Harris, an engineer, entrepreneur, former Googler, is actually on a campaign to fix this, to make some of this happen. And because he's an insider, because he worked it, because he started a company called Apture and then sold it to Google and worked at Google for a handful of years, he actually understands how all these places work. His point is, is that the reason our phones are so addictive is because the software is designed that way. The companies that make them, many of them, get most of their revenue from advertising. They say they're tech companies, but they're really media companies. And just as the cable companies and the TV networks make more money the more TV you watch, 
these Silicon Valley media companies make more money the more you're looking at your phone. So Harris's solution is pretty straightforward. If these devices and the software that runs them can be designed one that way, they can be undesigned that way. So they can be set up so that it's easier for us to turn notifications off, so that you can program Facebook to notify you once a day instead of every 30 minutes. So that if you wanted, you could restrict when you used apps at various points during the day. So if, for example, you had the urge to look at your phone at 7 o'clock at night, it would say something like, aren't you supposed to be eating dinner with your family? I've, been spend, I've spent the last three or four years looking for a program that would work on the iPhone that would allow me to control how long my kids spend on their phone. So it would allow me to control that, to say from four until five you can use the phone, but after that it doesn't work. I can't do it. Meanwhile, Apple could just enable that in settings easily. As a society, we actually know how to do this. In 1969, 26 people per 100,000 died in automobiles in the United States. And we decided that that was nuts, that that was, that we were going to do something about it. And so over the course of the next generation, we made drunk driving laws much tougher. We installed, we passed seatbelt laws. We got the car companies to put traction control and anti-lock brakes and air bags in their cars. And that crash number came down to now about 11 and a half per 100,000. Now, that's still way too high because it means 40,000 deaths a year from auto accidents. But what it also means is that had we not done any of that, that number would be closer to 80,000 or 100,000. So what I want to leave you with today is this. Instead of freaking out about what smartphones are doing to our lives, let's celebrate all the good that they do and just figure out how to create airbags and seatbelts for them. Thank you.